exactly sure why they asked me to come and speak to you, because I'm not here to talk to you about film. I'm actually here, even though I am a filmmaker, um, I live in, in Hollywood now. I don't know Madonna, so, and Warren Bay, I couldn't care less if he ever calls me, but um, they asked me to talk about this, Promise Valley. Anybody in here seen the play, Promise Valley? One or two people, three, okay, cool. All right, well, I'm gonna set this right here. Uh, Promise Valley, we're here at a history conference, and Promise Valley has a huge part to play in Utah history. But it's really interesting because a lot of people have no clue about the history of of this play, now <clears throat> this book, since 1991. And hopefully in the future, yes, a film, we're gonna get Trent to, to help us make films. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so I think that the idea here is to kind of bring you up to speed a little bit, and it'll only be a little bit because there is so much history involved in in Promise Valley and where it came from. In 1946, they were preparing for the centennial, uh, they, they called it the Utah Centennial, the, uh, the 100 year anniversary of the entrance of the Mormon pioneers into the valley. And uh, the governor of the state of Utah, Herbert Brown Moth, had decided that he was going to have a huge just the, the centennial was going to be was going to be amazing, so they commissioned a group of people to figure out what could be done to make this the biggest event in Utah to that point since the, the actual entrance of the pioneers. And one of the things that they decided they were going to do was they were going to have a big Broadway size and style <coughs> show that had never been attempted uh, west of the Mississippi, ever, at that particular time. And they looked around and they, they decided, okay, well, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do this? What should the story be? Very quickly realized, well, the story's gotta be the, the whole Trek West pioneer uh, experience. And if we're going to do this the way we wanna do it, we have to hire somebody that knows this business. And they looked around what was going on in New York City at the time, in Broadway. There was a man by the name of Arnold Sungard. And um, Arnold Sungard was a very, very popular and successful playwright. He had two hits on Broadway at the time, uh, <clears throat> Down in the Valley and uh, what was the other one? Do you remember? It's a, man, I have it. Down the Valley in the Great Com Campaign, the Great Campaign. Both running on Broadway at the time, and uh, an arm, young guy, great writer, graduated from Yale, and uh, was very successful. So he was approached and asked if he would be willing to write the story and the book of Promise Valley. So he flew out to Utah <laughs> and was introduced to the, the history and the sites. And, and he said, yes, by all means, I definitely want to do this. Now, of course, you know, back in the time in 47, 46, 47, right in there, this was the era of the big stage musicals. And so the, the natural progression of this was to bring in his writing companion uh, that uh, did his music and have him do the, uh, the lyrics, uh, the, the music, and his name was Kurt Will. But he wasn't available, he was on another project. So they had to then bring in someone else that could rise to the occasion. And just so happens that in Salt Lake City, there was a young man by the name of Crawford Gates. And Crawford Gates was, he was writing the music and orchestrating for KSL Radio at the time. They had a 13-piece in-house orchestra that, um, that he, would, he would write music the night before, and they would rush it in, 
and they would play the music, and it was it was amazing every day on KSL radio. And so they approached Crawford Gates. Crawford said, "Sure, okay, yeah, I get to work with Arnold Sungard, and I get to do this amazing thing." There was not a whole lot of time. By the time they had signed Crawford and Arnold to start this project, and remember, this was just one thing. One, it was, it was going to be a big show, but it was just one part of the centennial celebration. So they were given a room in the Hotel Utah, and they were sequestered away to write the Promise Valley and to write the music and the score and to create this thing. And uh, they had no idea what was going on outside around them uh, because they were so focused, the deadline was tight, and they had to get this done. So meanwhile, the pageant was being formulated. The, uh, there was a parade, of course, the days of 47 was beginning. One of the biggest things that happened during, the, and a lot of time, a lot of money went into choosing the queen the, the, the royalty, and uh, so there was a lot of a lot of effort put on that, a lot of effort on the uh, on the, the parade itself. There was um, there were other performances, uh, smaller scale performances that were being done. But as Promise Valley began to be created, and parts of it were sort of trickled out for approval by the, the commission. And remember, this was the state of Utah. That was doing this, not the uh, not the LDS Church. Uh, people started to talk, and a buzz was created that, of course, Arnold and Crawford didn't know anything about. But it was such a buzz that it began to drive the centennial celebration. By the time Promise Valley was to actually be performed, there was, dare I say, a fervor. And uh, it's really interesting. OK, a couple of things quick before we before I go into that. Just in case you know your history, Alfred Drake is the actor who played uh, Curly in the original Oklahoma on Broadway. He was cast as Jet, the, the male lead. And uh, Jet McDonald, who actually played opposite of Drake uh, on Broadway in Beggar's Holiday, was cast to play Celia. Okay, so now keep in mind, Utah, 1947. These are huge stars on the Broadway stage that are being brought in. Arnold Sungard, huge uh, writer from, from Broadway. The, uh, some of the, the technical crew, the producing crew, brought in from New York. Uh, there was a woman who was the, uh, one of the, the most popular, biggest choreographers in the world was actually brought in. And in something that had not been done previously, uh, of course on this scale, because nothing had been done on this scale, she bucked the trend to bring in all New York dancers, and she said no. There are dancers in Salt Lake City, and I'm going to find them. And she auditioned hundreds of dancers, and they were able to, to be cast and rise to the occasion. And so all of this was going on. People were so excited. They were watching what was happening. They were hearing how this was developing, and this was all going to be in Salt Lake City. So when, as all of this was, was going on, Ticket sales, they, they, they had a demand for ticket sales that was outrageous. So they began advanced, uh, the, the advanced sales of tickets. By the time Promise Valley opened, uh, or was ready to open the box office for uh, normal ticket sales, they had sold almost $50,000 in advanced sale tickets. And then I want to read this. This is a, a, an excerpt from an article in the Salt Lake Tribune. Because this kind of puts it into perspective. Uh, the, uh, the headline of the article is Promise Valley Commands Worldwide Ticket Sales. Theatrical history from the standpoint of handling ticket sales is in the making for the Utah Centennial Commissioned Epic Musical Drama Promise Valley. It was announced this week. 
Originally, ticket sales for any type of attraction are handled by a single box office, but that was too small an undertaking for the high-powered production staff of Thomas Valley. With more than $135,000 allotted for production, it actually cost $150,000 by the time it was done, of this lavish musical drama to be staged at the University of Utah Stadium Bowl nightly, except Sundays, from July 21st through August 9th, with Alfred Drake singing the star, singing star of the Broadway smash hit Oklahoma in the leading role, the commission wanted everyone to have an opportunity of seeing the extravaganza. In cooperation with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Centennial Commission and its arts division, headed by Dr. Lauren F. Wheelwright, production manager, hit on a brilliant plan. This is the plan. It actually says that. <laughs> this is the plan. <laughs> this is the plan. <clears throat> the church, with approximately 1,300 wards in the United States and foreign countries, would appoint one agent in each ward and would charge him with selling tickets to Promise Valley. And it went on to say that having, or actually at the bottom it said, that having done that, they already had advanced orders uh, in every one of those those wards. Now, whether all those people actually came, it's hard to say. But on opening night, the attendance, and remember, this is this is the uh, stadium. I'm going to show you a picture of it here in a minute here. This was 80,000 people in attendance on, uh, on opening night. So, Promise Valley the play exploded, and it ran for three weeks from July to August, on the closing night, 110,000 people had seen Promise Valley. 17 performances, almost all of them sold out. No one had ever seen this before, especially in, in Utah. So this was, this was a pretty big deal. So let me see. Oh, thanks a lot, Fred. Okay. <laughs> See, this is what you get when you're sandwiched in between the two stars. You know, you can just... This is the stadium. This is before it was Rice Stadium. This is this is the University of Utah Stadium. This is the uh, creation of the stage. This is the north part. All of the, the people were here. But you can see, get a sense of how big that was. Okay. Now a couple of things too that are really really cool to know. There's a guy, local guy, local Utah guy. His name was um, Harvey Fletcher. Anybody ever heard of him? Harvey Fletcher invented this little thing called stereo. And uh, he invented it in the 20s, but it hadn't really been used a whole lot. So, um, that, in fact, Disney had uh, just done Fantasia uh, in, uh, in five channel stereo. And that was the biggest use of stereo at the time. So they got Harvey and they said, hey, yo, Harv, can you help us out with the sound? So he came in and jacked in stereo into the existing speakers, used a three-channel system, blew everybody away. Mm -hmm. Amazing sound. Uh, this is... Okay, this is the night, this is opening night. And you can see the crowds there and, uh, and it was point the, the show. Uh, okay, so and I'm running out of time too, so I better hurry up. 
Let me show you. After the, after the huge success of the performance, it, uh, it went on sabbatical for a little while. And uh, it was, was not seen for a few years. But there was so much demand for it, so many people were asking to see it again, that the church built, this is called the Temple View Theater right here. And uh, if you can imagine, this is where the church office building stands now. Temple View Theater was built to house Promise Valley. And it, it became a thing that people planned their vacations around. Uh, it ran from 1965 to 1971 when they raised the theater to actually build the, uh, the church office building. It ran six days a week, eight weeks of the summer, and was, it was sold out every night. That well, wasn't sold out, it was free, but they, it was full every night. They gave people. Promise Valley was, it was well known to people all over the place. Uh, then, when they raised the theater in 1971, that wasn't going to sit well with people. So, this is a this is a picture of the old Lyric Theater in the 40s, and at the time, Bodville was on stage. Uh, it was a legitimate theater. It was a, it was a beautiful place, beautiful building. They, the church, bought this theater at the time, which was actually a movie house. It was the Lyric Movie Theater. Some of you have probably seen movies in it. This is a, an artist's rendering of how it was, oops, how it was going to look as the Promise Valley Playhouse. And a lot of people, they knew that this was called the Promise Valley Playhouse, but they never knew why. The Promise Valley was moved into the Playhouse and ran again for years, all the time continually. And people came from all over to watch it, and it was a huge, huge hit. Promise Valley, uh, after, when it was released, when uh, they got permission to release it to the public to be staged, it played all over the place. Uh, from small venues to the huge bowls like the, the stadium, university auditoriums, recreation halls, and uh, in, in theaters all over America. Uh, just to give you a really quick uh, idea. It played in the Greek Theater in San Diego, the Pasadena Playhouse in Pasadena, uh, the High Art Theater in Wyoming, Scottish Rite Auditorium in, in Stockton, the Hunter College Playhouse, which is on the campus of uh, Columbia University in New York City, all over the United States. But here's the, here's the kicker. Promise Valley became a world-class piece of work after it was translated and performed in six foreign languages all over the world. So uh, kind of an amazing thing. And uh, it's estimated at the time that we wrote the book, uh, it's estimated that uh, over 5 million people had seen Promise Valley. And by the way, uh, I'd like to recognize, this is Tip Boxell. Tip and I, he is my creative partner and uh, co-author of the book. And we, uh, in, in 1990, we, before the whole Mormon cinema thing had happened, we had just, we, we were looking for projects to do, and we thought, you know, Promise Valley, that would make the most spectacular movie. So we got together, and uh, the world wasn't quite ready for a Mormon musical, uh, so we decided we'd write the, the novel instead, which we did. We've had, uh, it's gone through two, uh, two editions, and uh, one of these days we may actually get around to making the movie. So, uh, you'll have to excuse me, I have a, another pressing engagement. I've got to, uh, I'm on my way to, <laughs> 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 so,